watch a video like that and, you're, and it already stirs up a little bit of emotion, right? Um, I want to welcome you today again to Eternal Rock Fellowship. If you're listening online, welcome to our uh, video. Um, I want to warn you ahead of time. Can I just give you like, have you ever seen like the warning at the beginning of the, the movie or whatever, or the show? This is for, uh, you know, uh, for a certain audience or whatever. Today might be a little bit of emotional, a little, a little emotional for, for some of us, maybe for all of us. Today um, might be a little bit difficult to hear uh, depending on your experience or depending on where you've been in, in your life. But I just want to say up front that um, God loves you and he has grace for all of us. Um, and, and I just, I just want to say that because uh, it's an exciting series that we're, going, we're coming into, but also at the same time, they're topics that we haven't dealt with before or we haven't talked about before, in, or, for, or it might have been a, a while since we've done that, but they're things definitely that the church needs to hear. In fact, we have our, our youth up here today so they can listen to this message as well, um, but I'm excited. The, the new series is called God's Moral Law. And uh, again, we're going to be talking about some things that we haven't done, and, and I want to just quickly go through what the next six weeks look like. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, what, it, what it's like to worship God. Um, for some of us, maybe we've never heard a sermon on, on, on worship and why we lift our hands or why we sing or why we do that and why worshiping God should be done before anything else in this world. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about we're going to be talking about honoring uh, God in our daily lives. Uh, social justice, uh, it's something different that we haven't. Sexual purity, respect, and fairness. And today we're going to talk about the sanctity of human life and how God feels about each and every one of us, about the fact that we're alive, the fact that we were born, the fact that we're here on earth, and. Here's what we're going to discover when we uh, talk about these things each and every week. And, and it's simply this, that when, when we cover what God says in his word, his moral laws, they're always going to bump up against what our culture says is right or wrong. When, when you talk about life and you talk about the value of human life and then you bump it up against, you put it up against uh, what, what the law says we can and can't do with, with, with uh, ch unborn children, what we can or can't do with, with, with the, in different situations, um, you're going to find that there's a con conflicting message between what the law permits and what God says is right or wrong. And so um, if you're taking notes, the first note is, is this. God's moral law often contradicts our culture's what? Our culture's beliefs. beliefs. God's moral law often contradicts our culture's belief. How many have found that to be true? Um, let's talk about this for just a second. I'm going to just give you a foundation for this whole uh, series. And let's simply talk about what morals are. Because uh, morals, all right, and, and, and bumping up against God's morals. Let's just talk about morals in general, okay? Um, how many would, would say, I have good morals? How many would just say that, right? Like, I, I do my best at least, right, to have good morals. Like, none of us do your best. We, we, we don't. Okay, um, morals. Here's basically morals. And what I love about this is this is true whether you believe God or don't believe God. So if you're coming back or you're tuning in or you're not sure where you're at with God or you still have all these questions about God, these things are still true even if you're not even there yet, okay? And if you're a Christian, we know they're true too, okay? So here's the thing. Um, what are morals? What, what are just some basic good morals? Um, how about just telling the truth, right? We, we love to tell our kids, always tell the what? The truth. Um, how about uh, not gossiping, right? Don't gossip, then we get quiet. The church always gets quiet when you say don't, don't, don't gossip, right? Don't gossip. That's not gossiping and choosing to not do that is having good morals. Um, not lying, right? Don't be a liar. We, we, all, we teach our kids and we, we know that having good, part of having good morals is not lying or never cheating or respecting other people or having integrity, being loyal, respecting yourself, keeping your promises. The list goes on and on and on, right, about what having good morals uh, uh, is all about. And whether you believe in God or don't believe in God or the Bible or not, this is true. Because you could ask your friends 
who may not be churchgoers, or maybe you're here today listening, uh, or you're not sure again, you could say, are these things that you would want your kids to do? And almost unanimously, I would say, yeah, it, your friends would say yes, right? Whether they believe in God or not, you would say yes, whether you believe in God or not. Um, when you do believe in God, it adds even an extra element to, this is not only what's right and true, but it's kind of because God says it's right and true, how we should live, right? Because we add the, the God component. So these are morals that most people, again, most people believing in God or not, um, uh, asks us uh, or agree, they agree with. Um, and, and in fact, God, uh, not only does he agree with having good morals as he teach that we should have good morals, God actually instructs Christians and people who uh, claim to have accepted Christ and believe in him, he instructs us to obey the laws of the land too. I don't know if you have ever read uh, about that or, how, or if, you've, if you know that or not, but God actually says in the Bible, let's read it in Romans 13, 1. He says this, everyone must what? Submit, right, to the governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. And so if you're taking notes, again, that next uh, line is Christians are to obey the laws of the land, all right? So I don't know if you knew this or not, but God expects you to drive the speed limit. God expects you to stop at the stop sign, right? He expects you to not do the U-turn, right, where you always do the U-turn when you shouldn't do the U-turn, right? He expects you to, to pay your taxes, right? He, he, he asks us to not only do all that stuff that we have to do every day, but to respect those who are in authority in our government, whether you like them or not, right? How many have a hard time liking everybody in authority in our government, right? Let's be honest. We could be honest. Nobody's going to take your nothing away from you, okay? Right? Um, it's not always easy, right? It's not always easy to say, I love what the president's doing, Right? Or I love what our governor did in the city. Right? Like we don't always agree with, with what's happening in, in, our, in our government, in our society. Um, in, In our, in our cities, or even in our nation, or around the world for that much. But God, he says, we are to respect those in authority. And here's what's interesting. The Bible is worldwide. The Bible just didn't, wasn't written for the U.S., okay? So even the people who live in third world countries, people who live in, 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 in Mexico, in Puerto Rico, and, and all these, where, where there's different laws or different people in, in, in authority who may even mistreat uh, their, their people or who have authority um, uh, laws and things like that that we completely disagree with, God still says you should submit to them because God in his word is saying that he put people in positions of authority, again, not to abuse it, but to keep the world in order. He uses government. He uses authority. He uses our, our, our law enforcement. He uses laws that were passed to keep order on the earth. And let, let me ask you this. How, has every, um, every rule you've put in your house always been kept? No, right? Would you like that they be kept, right? So you would, but they don't always, and they probably never will, right? And so again, but God still uses it good. Have you ever put a rule in your house that kind of backfired on you, right? You're like, man, I should have never taught the kids that one, right? Should have never gave them the password, right? And then, but you did, and it kind of backfired. So always, but you still want your kids to obey you, right? You still want, here's where I'm going with it. God expects us regardless to, to, to obey the laws of, of the land. Now, next question, is there ever a time, with that in mind, is there ever a time where we, we don't obey the law? Is there ever a time where we just, we, we can't do that because of what we believe, maybe? What would you say? Yeah. In, in the Bible, um, Peter and the other apostles 
were preaching the word of God just after Jesus left and ascended back to heaven. They were preaching the word of God. And, and, and the religious leaders of that day in Rome, they, were, they, they basically made it illegal to do that. And here, here's what happened when they caught up with them in Acts chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. It says, we gave you strict orders to, ne- to never again teach in this man's name, he said. They, can, they couldn't even say Jesus' name. Instead, you filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, him being who? Jesus, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any what? Human Human authority. And, And what Peter was saying that in this situation, for this moment, in this case, you're not going to stop us from preaching the word of God regardless of what law is passed. And you see it all the time, and it's the reason why missionaries still, depending on where they go in the world, are, 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 are their, their lives are put in danger because there are laws in certain countries, in certain places in the world where it's illegal to preach the gospel, but they're still going. And they're, they're, they're still hiding Bibles you know, in their clothes and figuring out w- ways to smuggle the word of God, even if it's illegal because it, it's God's moral law bumped up against the authority of the governing people, uh, whoever is governing uh, the land that they're in. You follow me with that? And, and it's, it's that important that they risk their lives for it. Um, and, and Peter and John, they, they were arrested for preaching the gospel, and the pen, there was a penalty for it. They, they got thrown in prison, and here's the thing that I want you to just to see in this little illustration here, this passage of the Bible, that even though um, they uh, went against the law, even though they kept preaching Jesus, even though they said, we're going to preach God no matter what, they still submitted to the penalty. And when they went to jail, they said, thank God, we're suffering for God. They were crazy, right? How many have ever said, thank you, Lord, I'm suffering for you, right? Not always easy to do. But even here's where I'm going. Even though they went against the law, they still submitted to the penalty of the law. And God expects us, again, to submit to authorities except for when it bumps up against his moral law. And these next six weeks, every single one of these things bump up against God's moral law. Today, we're going to talk about human life. And again, it, 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 it's a topic that, that is not easy to talk about. There, there's some things here that, that um, uh, you wish sometimes you didn't have to talk about, but they're so important um, to, to answer the question, how does God feel about us? And, 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 and maybe you could just ask yourself that real quick. How does God feel about me? How does he really feel about me? How does he feel about my children? And how does he feel about everybody who's alive in the world and everybody who was alive uh, from creation all the way to today. How does God feel about about us? And and I'll just start by saying this, that he values us because we were created in his image. Genesis 127 says this, so God created human beings in his what? His own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God created us in his own image. So if, if let's talk about what that means, his, his own image. What, what does that mean? The Hebrew word, and we have, I have that in your notes too. I have this in your notes. The Hebrew root word for the Latin phrase image of God is imago Dei. That's how you say it. And it means image, shadow, or likeness of God. So how you function, how you think, your abilities, your gifts were all given to you because you were created in the image of God. Here, here's, here's, here, here's what I mean by that. How many know somebody or how many are creative today? How, how many um, uh, realize that you're, you're creative, right? You're creative because we have somebody who created us who's even more creative, Right? I mean, to make this whole world and the universe that continues to expand to this day ever since creation, and and to, to, have you seen some of the places around the world? Have you just kind of Googled beautiful places around the world and seen everything that God did? And even though things are dying and we live in a broken world, it's a beautiful planet that we live on. 
and we're like nothing compared to the universe. God's creative, we're creative. We're, how many are spiritual here? We'd say, well, I try to be, right? Like, and how many, and here's the thing. Even if you don't believe in God, even if you're listening online, even all of us know somebody who doesn't go to church or struggling with, with God, they still some way want to be spiritual, whether it's go to yoga class, right, or, or whether it's, or it's go meditate, you know, on a mountain, or, or they, they still want to find some form of spirituality, even though they might not even believe in God. Why? Because God is spirit, and it was just kind of embedded in them, in all of us. We, how many like to communicate? And all the men said about their wives? No amens. We don't want to get in trouble, right? No elbows. No. We love to communicate, right? Because God communicates to us. And we're, we're beings that love to interact. We love to socialize. We, we love to get together and, and, and not gossip, right? We don't gossip, right? But we love to get together. And, 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 and just be together, celebrating together, because communication is something that is, is just ingrained in us. We're intelligent. We might not say that about everybody, right? But no, we're intelligent. We have the ability to create. We have the ability to invent. We have the ability because God is intelligent. And he gave us a little bit of that when he created us. We're relational because God is relational, because the Bible teaches that God has always lived with uh, one, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's always lived in perfect harmony in the Trinity. And when he designed us, we kind of have that, that, that same need to have somebody in our life, to have people around us. And if you, somebody, if you have ever known anybody who's isolated themselves or somebody who doesn't like, they kind of just die. Um, we're responsible. We, we want to have morals, even if we believe in God or not, because God is a moral God. God's a just God. Everybody likes justice, whether you le- believe in God or not, because God is a just God, and he kind of just gave us that. We want things to be fair. We want things to be right. We want things to be just, right? Because God kind of just put that in us. We're different than any other being created, we, we are different. We have to know that. We're different than any other being creative. How many pet lovers do we have here today? Cats, dogs, um, ferrets, right? Okay, we have a ferret family here. Um, any other uh, lizards, toads, birds? Um, uh, Evie's brother um, in Puerto Rico has uh, four dogs. Um, let me see if I get this right. Four dogs, uh, uh, a couple of parrots, and and I'm not kidding, 300 birds, okay? They, they built like a little house, a bird house, because it's his passion. Loves animals, okay? Loves them. Loves them, okay? Really, really loves. We're like, dude, are you serious, you know? Um, you, could, you could record the backdrop for movies here, you know what I mean? They're, it's just crazy, you know, just crazy, crazy. Um, But let me, let me just put it this way. If your family ran into hard times financially or you had to move, who's the first one to go? You eat the fair. Who's the first one to go, right? The youngest? Because we've had the dog for 12 years, right? The youngest is only three, right? No, no, the dog goes, right? The dog goes first, right? The, the birds go first, The animal, as much as we love them, it's a no-brainer that the animal goes first because there's more value in Junior, right, who's four years old, even though, even though dog's more obedient than Junior, right, even though the dog sleeps better than Junior sleeps, right, even though he doesn't eat as much, right, or doesn't make as much, he knows where to poop, right, Um, right, so, so, I said, did I say poop? (laughs) Okay, uh, he... (laughs) Right, like it's a no-brainer, and nobody would disagree with that. No, nobody would say you would the animal. The animal goes first, not not the human being, because we are created in God's image. We're special. We're unique, and you don't even have to know God to know that, because God put that in inside of all of us. Now there's similarities to our pets, right? How many have dogs that love to eat? right? 
How many love to eat? Right? Okay, there's a similarity there. How many love uh, to sleep, right? Yeah, the dogs love to sleep. How many are obedient, right? Sometimes dogs are more obedient, right? So there, there, <laughs> there, there's similarities, but, but, but check this out. If you um, are asleep and in the middle of the night, maybe you have, you're one of those people who sleep with your window open, it's nice summer night, and you hear a dog uh, crying or howling, or you hear a cat fight, or you hear something where it appears that an animal is either suffering or fighting or crying, um, most of us would just slam the window shut, right? Most of us, not all of us, but most of us, right, would just say, ah, somebody get their dog, right? Somebody, somebody do something with the dog, somebody, or maybe you might, you know, try to make a noise to get them to be quiet, Right? You would shut, shut the window, turn on the fan, try to make some white noise to get rid of it, block it out. But if the same thing happened and you heard a woman crying because she was being beaten by a man, or you, you heard a baby crying, but it wasn't just because the baby was hungry. The moms know there was a distinct suffering of a cry. Or, or you heard the smash of an automobile, right? And you heard you would be up. You would wake up, and you would either call the police. You, all the neighborhood would be outside, right? You, if, you were, if you were the big hero, you would run over there and try to, you know, the, the guys, we would try to go do something because it's a human being. It's not a dog. It's not a, a cat, right? It's not a squirrel that was on the side of the road, you know, because it got hit. Sorry, that was the little twitch. that I, I've seen that. Um, but, but it, it's, it's different because we have a higher value, right? We, we have a higher value than anything that was created. And what I'm trying to prove with this and point to is that you don't even have to know the Bible to know this is true. But it's evidence that there is a God. And that it's evidence that there is a God who said that he created us in his image, and here it is. Um, one of the most familiar... Uh, Verses in the Bible is Jeremiah 1, 5. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. He's telling the, the prophet Jeremiah because he, he's not sure about his calling. He's not sure. He feels young. And God's saying, wait a minute. I knew you way before. I had a plan for you way before. Because you have value. Your life has value. And we know we live in a broken world, and we know not everybody has the same capacity. We know not everybody can reach the same dreams. We know not everybody can do the same thing. But God uses everything together to work for his what? For his good, for those who love him, right? Good comes out of all of life if we, if we let God show us that. In Genesis 9, 6, God said, if anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own what? Image. One of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 13, says you must not what? Murder. You must not murder. Why, why did God say this? Why did God, why did God say you shouldn't murder? You shouldn't take somebody else's life because we're God's prized creation. We're, we're, we're his most valuable creation. And we talk about this all the time, but, but he set this whole place up for us. We got here on the sixth day after everything was ready for who? For us to live, to eat, to, 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 to establish families, to take care of the earth. We're the only ones that can do that. We were created for that. We're, we're his, his crown achievement, his biggest pride. And, and we're valued above everything else that was created. And we have no right to, to take what he's created and do what, with it what we want. So let's move on. If, if we believe that, if we believe that, that we're supposed to obey the law until it conflicts, and if we believe that God's image is what we've been made in, then let's, 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 let's go ahead and go here. Go ahead. Um, if we believe we're a God's prized creation, 
made in his image, then we should, that should influence how we feel about what? Abortion. First of all, I, w- I would just say this, and, and you can do your own research. Um, it's a scientific fact that life begins at conception. Look it up, research, ask your doctor. It's a scientific fact. And one of the most controversial subjects um, of our time is the issue of taking life through abortion. Okay? And, and let me clarify this. We're not talking about a, a situation where the mom's life is, the mom could possibly die because of, a, a, of, a, a, of an issue with the pregnancy. We're not talking about saving a mom's life. That's a separate issue. Uh, uh, what we're talking about is, is, the, is the choice, the law that, that is passed. And for some of us, um, maybe you remember the U.S. Supreme Court case, Roe versus Wade, Back in 1973, January of 1973, where this, the Supreme Court declared the legal right of a woman to have an abortion under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Because the, the, uh, the case was brought that the woman should have the right to do what she wants with her body. And it was a case filed by Norma, Norma McCorvey. Um, in the court uh, documents as, as Jane Roe against Hen- Henry Wade. And the district attorney of Dallas County from 1951 to 1987 who enforced a Texas law that prohibited abortion except to save a woman's life. And so that was the law before. The law before that was the, it was prohibited unless it was to save a woman's life. And the ruling after this case, Roe versus Wade, allows for legal abortions during the entire pregnancy but set up uh, conditions to allow states to regulate abortion during the second and third trimesters. So, so the U.S. as a whole has, has legalized this, but each state has their, their, their um, choice to vote, should it be during the first, second, or third trimester of the pregnancy as to when they can still do this and make this choice. And, and that's legal. And you don't go to jail for that. You don't, that that's, that's completely legal. And so if we say um, that we, conception, uh, or, or, or life begins at conception, and, and we say that, that we would never, we, the dog goes first, right? We would say that. Um, then, then how is it that, that a, a woman can still make that choice, right, out of inconvenience? And let me illustrate it this way. How many know and love Nick that comes here to our church? He's back, he's back there. Um. We love Nick, right? Let's give it up for Nick, right? Uh, I, I talked to Nick before, before and asked him permission to, to talk about him. We love Nick. He's been serving here uh, for almost since the church started um, for, for ten, almost 10 years now. And uh, Nick, if, if we were to bring Nick up here, and, and we won't, we, I just asked him if I could talk a little bit about him. Um, if you were... You know, Nick has a condition where he will always be dependent on, on his family and probably never able to uh, uh, make money or do the job that, that he wants or, or to be a millionaire or to be some kind of famous person. That probably will never happen, right? But if, if we were, I did some research. There's a picture of a horse that, that I have here. Um, uh, this horse uh, is named the Green Monkey. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Green Monkey. I don't know why Green Monkey... But in, in uh, December or, uh, of 2008, a woman by the name of Demi O'Brien purchased this horse for $16 million to make money with the horse, okay? And, and so when we talk about human life and we talk about value and we talk about culture, we talk about uh, um, if you were to put Green Mile up here and Nick up here, Nick's more valuable than Green Monkey all day long, Right? nobody would disagree with that. That if there was a choice, we don't care if $16 million was invested here, we know Nick is more important. And he will always be more important than, 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 than any animal. You can't, even from a monetary standpoint, you can't compare 
the two. Even if this horse stands to make another 16 million in the next 10 years, doesn't, place, doesn't replace, can never replace, and is never more valuable than Nick. Because we're created in his image. And on the flip side to that, when it comes to abortion, um, there's, there's over 3,315 children aborted each day in the U.S. There's a church that's close to Evie's grandma's house, and they have, um, they, they've made a campaign to bring awareness to this, and I have some pictures of it. They actually took 3,315 crosses, uh, uh, pink and, and blue, and they, they put them in their front yard of the church, the front property of the church, and put the sign in memory of the 3,000 killed a day. And, and, and here, here's where I'm going with this. We would never say, uh, Nick, or anybody who has uh, uh, an a, a, a inability or handicapped or is dependent for the rest of their lives, we would never say, you're, you're, you're just too much to handle. You're an inconvenience uh, so just away with you. Just, just get rid of them, kill them, slaughter them, right? We would never say that. We would never even think of that because out of inconvenience, but a woman has the right out of inconvenience to do that same exact thing because I don't want my body to change, because I still want to travel, because I don't want to lose my figure, because I don't want to be alone in this, because, I don't, because he left me, because right, right, all of the reasons that we, we've heard um, is, is, is saying the same thing out of inconvenience. But we would never think of it in any other context other than this issue and this debate and this law over legalized abortion. And it bumps up against God's moral law of him valuing life because we're created in his image. Now, with that said, um, I want to be as sensitive as I can, and that's why we, we set up at, at, said at the beginning that there's grace. If you're here or if you're listening, and maybe you did make that choice at some point because you were young or you, you felt like you didn't want to be alone or you didn't know what to do or it was a mistake or you didn't even know him, whatever the deal was, there's grace for you, and, and God loves you. And, and, and you can be set free if you've carried guilt with you. God, God can, can take that from you. Because just like the rest of us in this room, we've all done things that we've carried guilt for. And, 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 we've, we've, and, and for those of us who've surrendered it to God, we're free from that. And God's forgiven us for that. And I just want to say that, that God loves you, we love you, and you'll never be rejected by our church for any of those decisions that you've made. Let me, I want to show you a quick video um, about the uh, Imago Day. If human beings and all human beings are made in the image of God and are image bearers and have an elevated dignity above and beyond all the rest of creation. That shapes how we view abortion. That shapes how we view abortion. And, and speaking, if you're like, oh, here we go, a little Bible Belt Christian culture wars. No, no, no. I, I love to play the game of science, just not afraid of science in any way. Scientifically speaking, a human being is created at conception. That's not me going to Psalm 130. I'm telling you, the DNA strand and all that is necessary to be defined as a human being is present in the womb. If you would argue against that, well, it doesn't have a personality. It can't make decisions. It, it, it's still dependent on its mother. Then why don't we kill Darren? If that's what you want to believe, why don't we gather all the mentally ill and let's just slaughter them if that's how you want to define it. You can't define it that way. In fact, science is so on the side of life beginning at conception that the argument for choice has completely changed in the last year. The argument for choice is no longer that's not really a human, it's a fetus. And the argument is now 
The mother's life is more valuable than the baby's, even if the mother's life is not at stake. Her comfort, what she wants, what she desires is more valuable than the life of the human being, the distinct human being inside of her. This is wicked and dark, evil, built on a doctrine of demons, and it's murder. Now, the only people in this room right now are sinners in need of grace. That's the only people in this room. And so if you're like, man, this is my first time in church in three years. You're going to start us off with I'm a murderer. Knowing who we are is the best way to get where Jesus wants to take us. So yes, I am. Now the hope is that regardless of what baggage we've carried in here today, that Christ is bigger and that Christ's forgiveness can lay on top of whatever we've done and forgive and heal and deliver. Mary would say amen to that. Let's, let's move on. I got a little bit more that I want to talk about. If we believe, next point is this, if we believe we are God's prized creation made in his image, um, then that should influence also, we could put there, how we feel about pornography. You didn't see that one coming, did you? Um, I want to read a, an excerpt from, from a, a, a article that I read this week. Sin is most powerful when unknown. And, and few sins among Christians are more destructive and secret than pornography. In Bible Studies for Life, Chip Ingram writes, 13% of all uh, web searches and related are related to erotic content and almost 9 out of 10 young men, 85%, and almost half of young women, 48%, report viewing pornography. More troubling than the overall data is that related to followers of Jesus. Listen to this. 50% of men and 20% of Christian women regularly view pornography. Too many from the body of Christ are being eaten up from the inside uh, by this secret sin. Marriages are suffering. Husbands did not love their wives as they should. Wives are looking for uh, pleasure apart from their husbands. Single adults are allowing pornography to substitute for actual relationships rather than remaining mentally pure. Seven of ten teens have accidentally been exposed to pornography online. This exposure can permanently affect their ability to, to have deep relationships. It could torpedo, mar torpedo marriages before the I do's are even spoken. Did you hear that? If we believe that we're God's prized possession and we're valued in his eyes, and we're above anything else that's been created and, and the most important thing ever, then that should shape how we view or how we fight against pornography because pornography is self-seeking. Pornography is, 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 is to get what you want out of it and to use God's prized possession to do it to use somebody that God created, somebody's daughter, right, somebody's son, somebody's husband or wife, and, I, and I'll never get this in a million years, why um, uh, uh, women, and I'm not talking about anybody here, but by, by, by women would go crazy over a star that's married with kids and not over their husband. There he is, ah, right? <laughs> He's married, he has kids, have some respect, that's what I think. Or the other way around. Guy's doing the same thing, right? Am I, am I touching some nerves, right? I don't get it. I don't get it. Why would you post that, like that, look at that, when that's not yours and it never will be yours? Look at your own. Invest in your own, right? The other day, we were going to barbecue, and, and uh, how many use the little stick lighter when you go to barbecue, right? The <laughs> so I go out to, the, to our little deck, right? And I open up. We have steaks. And, and you know, guys, steaks, we're already tasting it, right? Um, so I'm clicking, click, 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 right? Click, click, nothing. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, we're not having a barbecue. I'm freaking out. 
It's how you eat, no barbecue, whatever, put it on the stove, it's not going to taste the same, blah, 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 throwing a fit, right? She goes, she has to look up. She walks over there and uses the little lighter that comes with the barbecue, right? And, and she walks over there, does that little thing. Didn't even say a word, totally as a man, I was like, oh, no, you know, feeling like couldn't get the barbecue lit, right? And uh, that's the end of that story. No, here's, here's what I saw in that story. Um, some guys and women, you're so used to using something external to light the fire in your marriage, right? That when that external thing is not there, you don't even know how to use the button that your wife came with. right? Can, can we say amen? Is it, can, right? You're like, how did you get that out of that, right? It's true, though. It's true because these things, they destroy your marriage because you're so used to finding pleasure and finding things in, in other sources that when that source is ran out, the oil's gone, you don't know how to light the flame anymore because you're, you're finding it in, in the wrong place. For, for, for the wrong reasons, and, and it's destroying everything um, that, that we know. And not only, and, and hear me out here, we're, we're finishing here in a minute, but hear, hear me out. Aside from the d- destruction that pornography does to your family, to your children, if you're found out, to your public image, to your, your reputation, put that all right here for a second, Aside from that, pornography, if you view it at any level, okay, at any level, free, an app, you pay for it, you buy it, whatever, at any level that you use, you're investing into an industry that will continue to invest back if if you keep fueling it. And, and, And what else does that mean? That means that Sex trafficking will continue. That means that women who never wanted to, who just wanted a dad and decided that at 18, I need to find some kind of love and somebody said, hey, why don't you try this, right? And they're just seeking and they, they, they feel undervalued. They feel like nobody cares, so they're doing that or, or maybe that's the best way that they can make enough money to raise their children. But none of them, and, and, and you, can, you, can, you could search this up, you can uh, ask around, you could look at statistics, the women who dance, the women who pose, the women who who do all this, who who perform, they don't feel valued and it's not what they really want to be doing. And men, women, at any level, if you view this, you're creating the demand for it. Got another quick video I want to show you, and then we'll wrap it up. This is Anna. Wait, wait, don't click to someone else yet because Anna's stuck here on your computer screen. And while you can walk away, her image is stuck on the internet. See, your fantasy is Anna's nightmare. There's a good chance recruiters lured her with flattery. Perhaps they baited her with cash. Maybe they even tranquilized her with date rape drugs. And if Anna's like many others, she stays sedated with alcohol, weed, or coke to numb the pain. Chances are she faces STDs and HIV because she's denied access to protection. We don't know what she's been through because we only see Anna smiling. And they keep showing Anna smiling so that you'll keep watching. See, pornography is integral to human trafficking and prostitution. In nine countries, almost half, 49%, said that pornography was made of them while they were in prostitution. This generation fights sex trafficking more than anyone ever has, and more than anyone ever has, this generation consumes porn. Fighting human trafficking and then watching porn is like protesting a corrupt politician and then donating to his campaign. You browse privately going from Anna to Zoe and back to Anna. Watch your favorite fantasy and then walk away. But Anna's still there, she's stuck there, stuck in this life because you click. Each click, each link, each URL visit and play button, this is the currency of porn, this is the price of Anna's life. 
The $100 billion pornography industry is fueling the appetite for children as well. Teenage girls now make up the biggest slice of viewable porn, which by definition is considered trafficking. The demand for porn fuels the trafficking industry and you can take away that demand. You can cut the cord on this machine. You can bankrupt the system. You can empty the pimp's pockets. You can free Anna by simply refusing to click. Job um, said this, Job 31.1. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, Paul said, God's will for you is to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. And so here, here's how I want to finish and, and, and we'll be done. Um, maybe you've never, uh, never got involved with this, never viewed it, you've stayed away. That, that's awesome. That, that's great. Um, but I, I would also caution you and I would also warn you, men and women, um, because of the internet and because of how uh, destructive it can be. Um, be careful even what you like on the internet. For some of us um, uh, guys, maybe you use the excuse that I want to I wanna, I wanna, uh, uh, like and see the feed of these, the, these uh, bodybuilders or these people who have the six-pack abs because secretly you just want to see the girls that have the abs, right? Or you still want to see, and it's a different way of viewing what you probably shouldn't view anyway. Be careful, be careful. It's, it's, it, the, the enemy can use it as a lure to, to take you other places. And, and no woman or no man wants to know that you're finding any kind of fulfillment at any level more than you are from them. And maybe you've never had that conversation with, with your, your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and maybe it's time you do. Maybe it's time you say, you know all those pages you like? I really wish you wouldn't because it makes me feel like you like them more than you really like me or you like viewing how they look versus how you uh, li- love me and hug me and, and, and view me. Maybe, that's, maybe it's time for, for that. And for those of you who know me personally, you know how passionate I am about, about this and how, how much it bothers me when I, when I see uh, people who, who are married, people who should do this, and they're just posting these things all over like it's no big deal. Man Crush Monday, right? It, it's sick. And the devil will use it to take you other places. Stop. Your last note says that the church should always have a voice in the fight against the sanctity of life. It starts with us saying that we choose to value life. We choose to value the unborn. We choose to contribute to saying that, that we don't want kids aborted. And rather, let's help support the parents who might be on their own or or parents who might figure that they couldn't have done it. And let's choose to not click. Let's choose to to keep our minds clear. And let's choose to to, to keep God front and center when it comes to how he feels about those of us, which is all of us who are created in his image. What do you say? Let's pray. Lord, um, we know, Father, that these conversations and these uh, messages, Father, all hit home in a different way for us. And Lord, um, for those of us who never knew uh, how much value you place, Father, on, on us, um, I pray, Lord, that today would be just a day where they look at life different. They look at you different. They look at uh, uh, the, the issue of abortion different, the issue of pornography different. And Lord, I pray um, for those of us who 
have struggled or maybe uh, are addicted or have an issue, Father, and it's hurting uh, uh, our, our marriage, our relationship, or, or maybe it's still a secret, Father. I pray, Lord, that today would be an awakening, Father, that your Holy Spirit would begin to move in the hearts of those of us here that, that secretly um, view these things or, or, or never really thought about the implications of life, your, being in your image or abortion. I just pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts today. And I pray, Lord, that for those who have made that choice to have an abortion, um, I pray, Lord, for, for those women, Father, that you would give them grace, that you would comfort their souls, Lord, that you would remind them that they are loved, Father, that you would remind them, Father, that, that, that you died for the sins that they have committed, Father, and that you will forgive them and love them and restore them and see them back to a healthy state of, of being, Father. And so, Lord, anybody who's carrying guilt with them this morning, Lord, would you be with them? And would you remind them, Father, that, that you are love and you forgive, Father? And those who are struggling with, with Lord, with, uh, with addictions, Lord, would you please, um, whether they get help, confess, stop, whatever it looks like, Father, Lord, help them. Lord, as we finish today, Father, I pray, Lord, that this would be a day where um, things change in the, in the lives of our church. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>